Hello and welcome to Access Chat from uh, the tropics of Surrey today. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Sophie Morgan. Sophie and I met just over a year ago in Argentina. Uh, it's a bit of a recurring theme, Argentina at the moment with Access Chat, but, um, but we, we met because we were part of the, the Global Disability Summit. But Sophie will be well known to people in the UK because you present on uh, Channel 4 for the Paralympics. And uh, um, part of our sort of broadcast network around um, disability sport, but you've been doing some other stuff as well. Um, so, uh, or, or were in the process of doing other stuff as well uh, at the point when COVID interrupted. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you know, your background what, uh, and, and what you were planning to do and, and, and what you are still planning to do. And I will hey, stop yeah. all of the Skype calls coming in at the same time as trying to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Neil, thanks. And hi, guys. Thank you for having me. Yes. So um, a bit of background. I Yes, I do do the presenting for the Paralympics, the live broadcasting on Channel 4. And I've done um, a couple of the games now, but the biggest ones I did really was when I um, was in Rio and did the live afternoon show, which was both terrifying and fascinating and brilliant all at the same time. So I did, I did do that and I've done a lot of disability sports um, broadcasting, so other events, other world events and challenges and stuff like that. But I also have had the real privilege of stepping away from making programs around disability and working on stuff that's nothing to do with my disability, which was for me a bit of a goal. I really wanted to try and be reporting on things or making documentaries about things and my disability not really be the focus of the of the content. So I've d done some um, uh, current affairs documentaries, so Unreported World in the UK and Dispatches, which is quite a kind of high profile um, current affairs strand for Channel 4 News. Um, so I've done a couple of those and then I've done some more fun stuff like a property series, um, a renovation series around property and some arts shows and um, various other things. So it's been a really interesting uh, journey into TV and, and also in, you know, on my, I have a bit of a personal agenda to try and improve the representation of disabled people. So it's been a kind of, it's been a long time coming. It's been a lot of work. I, I've, been, I've been in the game for a while um, and I was just, just about to really just land my dream job. I, I basically, finally, honestly, I've been working for it. I can't even tell you how long, maybe maybe two or three years I've been planning it, but for about a decade, I've been dreaming of it, which was a travel show. And I have an adapted motorbike. It's called a Riker. Um, it's hand controlled motorbike. And I was going to be riding my Riker across Southeast Asia to the Paralympics to arrive in time and then present the games. And I was going to be making all of this in a doc documentary series, which in itself would have been not only the dream job, it would have been a bit of a, a first in many ways because there's not many disabled women who to present, there's not many disabled women who present off the back of a motorbike. Do you know what I mean? There was a lot of, there was a lot of glass ceilings kind of that I was trying to, trying to break down there. And we were literally just about to, to leave when the lockdown happened and everything's been canceled. So my life's taken a bit of a different plan now, a different path like all of us. Um, and I don't know what's next in terms of the journey, but I'm, I'm, I'm busy now, kind of stepped away from TV for the moment because filming is not really too possible at the, in the UK currently, um, anyway, for me anyway. And um, I'm now writing a book. So I've kind of, yeah, had a massive change, but it's, it's you know, one door closes, another opens. That sounds awesome. Uh, I mean, the, the, what you had planned and, and let's hope that uh, it can come off in 2021 because they're still planning for, for Tokyo. So, um, yeah. but tell us a little bit uh, about this book that you're writing. Um, yeah, I honestly, I, I, I kind of can't believe I'm saying this because I'm, I haven't written before. I've got no, I mean, I write for, as a journalist, you know, I write articles and, but nothing like this, the undertaking of writing a book. Wow. Terrifying. But basically it's a memoir. It's a story about what happened to me about my injury, but it's much about, it's about really how, how to be a disabled woman, how to be a disabled daughter, my relationship with my mum and the strain that's put on us through after my injury, but then how it's brought us closer um, and, and the journey we've been on together 
um, and also really how to be, you know, a disabled girlfriend and the various challenges that I've faced and the various opportunities I've had since my injury. So it's a, it's, it's a bit all encompassing at the moment. I mean, I, my editor's going to have a work cut out when I finally give it to her because I've really gone in, but I really want to shine a light on not only my own journey, but what it's like to live with disability, a physical disability and you know, the challenges that I faced in my professional and personal life. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of things and um, we'll see how it goes, but it's, it's a challenge, you know, who doesn't love a challenge? I love a challenge. And you know, the, the, it, it, we were, before we got on air, we were talking about YouTube and I'm following, I've become just this ridiculous YouTube user um, during the pandemic. And, and there are people out there, and it's not just YouTube, but I'm just going to use that as a channel, where they're doing something like the, the book you're talking about, and they're really showing us their lives so yeah. that we can, like, there's this one woman I love, and she lives in the country in Sweden. And, um, and she, you know, whenever, you know, there are times in where she lives where there's, there's no daylight at all except one hour of a day. And then in the summer, it's all light. And so, and she, she just shows us snippets of her life. And I find it so fascinating. And I see, I, I am an author of three books and they are so hard. It is so hard. It, I don't know why it's like easier to write articles than books, but yeah. I could see because you, I know a little bit about it, your life and you have such a interesting life story. And I think, I think there are still so many misconceptions about being an individual with a disability, especially um, somebody that acquires a disability later in life. I mean, like my daughter was born with Down syndrome. It's who she's been since she was conceived. But it's a, it's a very different journey when you acquire a disability. And so I, I could just see so much happening because of the book, um, so many different journeys you could take with that telling your story because, I, it, but you also have a, a very interesting story. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about being an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. that's of course how I met you. I met you. Uh, yeah. in at the United Nations in New York City after Neil introduced us from a cab in Argentina. So <laughs> I was talking to Neil and he's like, Deborah, you got to meet Sophie. And so so it, Neil Rock is all connecting everybody. But tell us, tell us more about your entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey and how that sort of ties in sort of to what life's bringing you now. Do you know, honestly, Deborah, I think the that it all started in so many ways when I had my injury. And like you say, the, the acquiring of a disability is such a specific experience. And obviously it's unique to everyone. Everybody experiences that differently, but there are some shared, you know, experiences through that. And I think, so I found other disabled people kind of say similar things to me that, they, you know, their, their life took on a new meaning after their injury or after their acquired disability. So, so I, I was paralyzed when I was 18 in a car crash and basically I had no intention really of going into any TV or any entrepreneurial kind of, I really didn't have any ambition to go anywhere near anything to, you know, I, I didn't have any plans is the words I'm looking for. So what happened really was I kind of stumbled out into the world as a wheelchair user and came up against so many barriers, so many different challenges. I, I had almost, I felt like I had no choice but to try and do something about it, try and create a solution to a problem. So that kind of, I guess that entrepreneurial thing came out of a you know, real need to, to, to better my life and the life of other people like me. I really wanted to try and do something. So if I saw a problem, for example, I, that's how I kind of got into retail and working with retailers and fashion, because I really found that that space was somewhere where disability was lacking and how can I go in there and try and make a change? And that's when I started my journey really into into entrepreneurialism but you know it was very much born out of my frustrations with how difficult it is to be a wheelchair user and or how to be a disabled person and and like you say the misconceptions around our lives and our lived experience and what we can and can't bring to the table so um so yeah it's been a mad journey it's honestly been uh, looking back over the last 10 years which is now what i'm doing when i'm writing this book the last 18 years sorry is it's been um you know so so unexpected and i kind of basically every single time i've seen there's a door shut 
to to progress i kind of try to start banging on it and trying to get in there and i've used where possible i've tried to leverage my platforms that i have on tv or have, a, have a, as a voice on social media or wherever i can um to try and you know do something with that whether that's working like you say like going into retail like i said going into retail and trying to help make change there or if it's more advocacy work and working you know with other communities that don't have such a voice and yeah it's you know the thing is with disability there's so many things that need help and change and you, it's almost like sometimes i think you just pick a problem any problem and let's go for it and try and change it and that's kind of almost been the way that my my, my mind has taken me that's my my my, my thinking process is like right what can i do now here so the areas i mostly work in are areas that I really, you know, live in. So it's fashion and retail, uh, design and travel. So those areas are the areas where, you know, I really want to make change because it directly impacts my life and it's, you know, so much change needs to be made. Sophie, I, I want to ask a quick question and then turn it over to Antonio and Neil. But one thing, uh, so I can't, I can't claim that I understand your journey completely, but I remember one time I, I hurt my leg really bad. I um, had a, um, a racquetball accident and I, um, it was so bad that three strong men had to pick me up and carry me out of the gym. And, and I didn't walk for um, eight to 12 weeks at all. It, it was really very different for me, but I was so surprised that the subtle differences, the way people were treating me, I had a temporary disability, but society did treat me differently. I was really, and it was subtle, but there were these really obvious nuances. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm always, I've always been fascinated with that part of it. And I was wondering if you wouldn't just talk a little bit about that, because I know that ties into your work and into yeah. certainly the book you're writing and the stories you've done. And, uh, but they, I think sometimes people don't understand these things right. because all of a sudden you're not Sophie, you're something else that society's decided. And, and I, I'm fascinated by that aspect. You know, so am I. And thank you for that question. I think it's something that I will be constantly thinking on for the rest of my disabled life. I mean, having a visible disability in the sense that I, I'm a wheelchair user, a manual wheelchair user, you know, that, People see that before they see me. So what that means is, is the, the, all the stereotype that, that that chair has in that person's understanding, they put onto me. And that's, you know, do you know what though? The thing is I've really learned about myself is that I was very much the first disabled person that I actually ever met. Because before my injury, I didn't know any disabled people. I mean, I, you know, I really didn't interact at school. There weren't any kids with, especially with physical disabilities. So my, um, you know, my learning and understanding or trying to unpick the kind of casual ableism that I get, I kind of go, no, I get it, because I would have probably thought those things too sometimes. I mean, there's a scale, okay? There's a scale where it comes from a sort of soft bigotry to a, you know, outright discrimination, of course. But I think the subtle things that you're talking about, those little, little subtle ways in which people don't quite realize that they're talking to you differently or they're thinking about you differently. Do you know, I'll give you a little example. Things like People say to me, they often say they don't, what they don't say is, for example, what do you do for a living? They'll say, do you work? So it's a very small thing. Okay. And I, I obviously don't take offense at that, but you know, these are, that's an insight into thinking, well, why wouldn't I work? Why do you think I can't work? Why don't you ask me what I do? Um, and, and I mean, obviously that can speak to a number of other things. The fact that many disabled people, especially in the UK, do struggle to get work for lots of different reasons. We don't want to unpick all of it, but you see these subtle little things that happen, especially with, with, with men, the way that men interact with me as well, when it comes to sort of, you know, the sort of soft things that people say. I remember one guy, for example, saying to his girlfriend, in front of his girlfriend, gosh, isn't she good looking for a person in a wheelchair? You know, and it was sort of this really, would you say that to an able-bodied woman in front of your girlfriend? You know, these little things that you kind of, I can, I can give you a million examples where they're not meant to be rude, they're not meant to be hurtful, but they give an, you an insight into what that person thinks of you immediately uh, without you even speaking. I mean, let's not even get started on the things that people say about being an inspiration as well. You know, it's the word that follows you around everywhere you go. I just 
leave the front door and I'm an inspiration to some people. It's, it's really, it's really subtle, but these things are changing. And I think even over my lifetime, since I was injured 18 years ago, I've seen the improvement. And I think social media plays such a great part in that and getting the language right and getting the tone right and getting the messaging right, you know, and it's a thrill to be a part of that and to watch others do that. I love that. No, uh, uh, reflecting on, on that, um, and you have worked, you have uh, working in 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 media before, part of your life as well. We, we had we had a few actors on Access Chat uh, who, who have been you know, working in Hollywood. Yeah. But no, why? Uh, why no? And when we sometimes when we look at different television channels all over Europe, we don't feel that they represent society in general. Sometimes we see, you know, a panel with four men and one woman, and sometimes we only see men in the panel. And even at that level, we only see people from a specific ethnic group, sometimes managing the panels. And of course, we rarely see anyone with a disability. So how, in, back to your experience, how, how important it is that in the media, people will, will media somehow reflect society it's itself and people with disabilities can be seen in the media uh, working just like anyone else in fairness do you know i honestly for the life of me still don't know why this hasn't got been gotten right it's been it's so frustrating because you just think if this isn't hard come on guys this isn't hard but what i've noticed and especially in the uk is that there are two main tropes that we see when it comes to the representation of disabled people. On one end of the scale, you've got the superhuman hero, Paralympics, like Wonder Woman, disabled person who doesn't need any help and you know, would, would never be on benefits and can do anything and has just overcome their disability. And then the other side, you've got the benefit scrounger who lives at home, who is no value to society or to their family, is a drain. There's these awful, but there's polarity that between, and I, I feel so frustrated when I see that proliferate again and again and again, that there's, where's the middle ground? You know, the normal disabled person that just lives a normal life and has their disability and just gets on with it. And those stories are the ones we need to be told, we need to see more on, on screen. And to your point about, you know, the smaller little representations when it comes to a panel, and it should be diverse, it should, you know, and you're not seeing someone with a visible disability there, let alone anyone with an, a hidden disability. These are things that I will fight for forever. I'm sure you know we all feel the same. It, 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 representation matters so much, um, but the wrong type of representation matters too. And I think that sometimes you just get people ticking a box, you know, and saying, "Oh, well, we just." And I definitely have been victim of that myself. I've been a tick box. And I know I have, you know, we are doing this show about the Paralympics. Let's get a disabled girl there. Now that's good and bad. That's good and bad. And I think that these are things that we need to keep working on. It's important to be in the room, but you need to be in the room in the right way. Um, I mean, look, we're talking very much in the UK at the moment about the lack of the black disabled voice um, just uh, on screen. And, 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 you know, these are, there's a long way to go when it comes to representation. Um, but yeah, like I say, I think that there's also a danger in just chucking anyone up there and just hoping that will do when actually that can be more detrimental. I, I think um, Deborah probably would want to follow up on, on, on this to a certain extent because you just, in the chat, I saw she was saying people with disabilities can only work in, in the field of disability, which is something yeah. that I think we all want to see change. Yeah. Um, but also, um, Deborah has a number of people working in her organization that uh, you know, are from different parts of the world and different ethnicities and have a, a very different experience. So maybe Deborah, if you wanted to speak. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Yeah, it, 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 I, I know that one of my employees, uh, Lamandre, he was born with a type of muscular dystrophy. And when he started working with me again, he worked with me at my old company, Tech Access, but we didn't want to make him the chief inclusion officer or the chief we wanted it really because he's so much more than his disability and i will also say sophie he we've had some conversations about this i said to him one time and i was being really nice and and i'll tell you it wasn't that long ago sorry but i said you know lamandre when i see you i don't even see your disability 
I don't, and I meant that Sophie as a compliment. I really did. I don't even see your disability. And he said, Deborah, I, I understand why you're saying that, but I want you to see all of me. I want you to see yeah. all of me. And the reality is I'm an African-American male. I'm from the South of the United States. I do have a disability. I, you know, and he gave a few other things. And, and we just talked about those, those nuances. And he's like, I want you to see me. I want you, I want you to acknowledge my disability. I don't want you to be afraid of acknowledging. But you know, it's almost like the Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. I'm learning as an American so much about my fellow Americans with darker skin than me's journey that, that I didn't know. And then I, I posted something about um, there, the state that I live in, in, um, in the United States, I live in Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And our governor just passed a law a few months ago that said that it is illegal for employers to discriminate against you, you for your hairstyle. And I know Antonio commented on that, but I was shocked. I was like, what do you mean we're discriminating against people because of their hairstyle? So I posted it and this woman, this African-American woman came on and she's like, well, it's because you're privileged. And I yeah. thought, I'm yeah. privileged? I, 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 okay, and I am, I am privileged, I'm white, I'm, I'm from the United States. There's a lot of ways that by the way, we're all privileged, but yeah. she, she made it, she made it sort of a hostile situation and, and the conversation stopped. Nobody could learn anymore. And I understand she's frustrated, but I, I was just seeking to understand. So I think one thing we've got to do a better job of across the board, whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter, where we're talking about, I know Antonio is very big on supporting women and diversity and panels and, and in conversations, but we have to encourage our allies to ask questions and to ask maybe even stupid questions. You know, it's like, Sophie, mm -hmm. you're so pretty and you're so young and you're in a wheelchair. Yeah. So it's like, if we don't have the candid, important conversations, and once again, the conversations of, I don't see your disability, um, Sophie, well, part of your identity is that you use a wheelchair. That's part of your identity. And your work reflects that. But at the same time, as, as Neil was saying, I think a mistake we keep making is we think somebody, and I understand why. I know we had a gigantic fight here in the United States with Gallaudet University when um, a president was hired that wasn't deaf. And they just went up in arms and they said, no, we want somebody that's deaf that represent us. And I understand that. That makes sense. But I do think we're really, it's a really bad habit that we always have to put people with disabilities in the disability field when actually people with disabilities are human beings. and. We should actually be and, that, uh, and and it is the same with, with sometimes with with chief diversity officers is about yeah. let's take and sometimes instead of looking to someone who really has the talent and the capacity to make things happen we just hire to make sure that we fill in a box okay now we hire that person and we can just the ceo can walk away the work is done if everything goes wrong, oh, we just have a chief diversity officer here. She will reply to all your questions. And I don't think this is working, no? Do you know, it's such an interesting contrast to make. Okay, so, so ableism and racism are not the same things, but there's some similar parts um, coming out that I, I, like you, Deborah, you know, I, I found it really interesting learning about how, well, A, what I don't know, which is our, obviously our privilege, the things that we don't know that we're learning about, the lived experience of people with, you know, black people, of people of color. And I think that, so as a disabled person, uh, when, when someone gets it wrong and says the wrong thing, I don't, I really try my hardest to never say anything like, you know, to, to really come down on them and just say, no, 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 don't worry about it, you got it wrong. This is the right way to do it. And I encourage that conversation. But, you know, I get the fear of people's, I, people's fear of getting it wrong is I felt in myself in the Black Lives Matter movement recently. I'm like, have I said the wrong thing? And I can feel my own fear. And I really recognize that in other people's fear when talking about disability. So I, I bring that up because I think that um, when it comes to putting people with disabilities into positions where they like, you know, like a chief diversity officer, it's almost like, they it should be there on merit, they should be there on talent, you know, but then they also, there's a huge responsibility on the disabled people themselves to constantly have to be the ones to educate, constantly. And 
is that just what you have to do or is that because i've been told by my friends my black friends you know educate yourself don't keep asking me questions it's your job to do the work but i don't do that with disabled people uh, you know i'll say I, I, i'll be there i will hold your hand through this i will tell you what to do and say and i do that as a consultant not just in a personal relationship i do that in professional relationships without sounding patronizing but often my role is literally to talk them through what they can and can't say you know as a as a as a brand and and, and you kind of think I think that's okay. I'm going to have to do that. But you know, it, it's there's a, such a fine line between it being a token gesture, being you know, just and I, I, I don't have the answers actually. I, you know, I don't really know where where how to get it right. But I do hope that to think that when I've been in that role, when I've been brought on as a consultant, or when I've been brought on as a presenter, that my disability is there for a reason. But I'm there for the main reason, you know. And that's something that you've got to just work out with yourself, or work out for yourself. Yeah, I, guess. I think it's yeah. tricky. I think it's tricky. We need to find that balance between um, representation and understanding of lived experience because the lived experience is important and mm -hmm. people that haven't lived it don't necessarily know everything and therefore, uh, like in the case of the university, may not be able to represent the people adequately. But at the yeah. same time, what I don't want is to that be, become the only career path that people can have. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it's a choice that we make uh, as individuals that we want to go in and, and advocate or, uh, or, or, or want to make a change. Not everyone does. A lot of people want to go and do something else, you know, and, and therefore uh, what, what's important to me is to see that the you know, talent is recognized and that, that we can be appointing people who are, uh, you know, out and disabled because not all of us are, you know, visibly disabled um, yeah. in positions that are not anything to do with disability uh, uh, but but where disability can inform uh, how they make decisions and hopefully how they can improve society uh, whether that be in the media in technology in politics or whatever so I, I think that there are some interesting things happening um, I really hope for example that Joe Biden picks Tammy Duckworth yeah. As a as a running mate, because I think that that would be super interesting to have someone that is, you know, uh, an out disabled yeah. vice president. You know, it's not that we haven't you know, the U.S. hasn't had a disabled president, but but actually, if you look back through the history of Roosevelt, he hid his disability most of the time. Yes. So he was yes, he pictured did. behind desks. He was pictured standing at a lectern. Uh, it, it was it was really um, something that was was kept away from the general public as much as possible. Whereas, yeah. uh, you know, the change with someone like Tammy Duckworth is that she's absolutely, you know, it, yeah. <laughs> it's clear to everyone that that she she and she's she an American Indian and, and yeah, how and she acquired her disability, you know. And so I was she, gonna say, and also oh, how yeah. she acquired her disability yeah. and everything. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think when I had my injury, I didn't have social media. It wasn't as prevalent then. And I didn't see anyone with a disability in, in the public, you know, in, in the public eye. It just, I mean, I think Superman had just had his injury or near about, you know, all the stories were about you get your disability and you, you know, you, your life is ruined. So these stories are the just so important aren't they they're so important but yeah it's, it's it's complicated in getting the messaging right i mean there's recently with the actors i know you talk about the actors like the cripping up concept and stuff that we've been seeing going on and how some people just don't seem to get how offensive that is you know um so it's, it the thing is i think as if you live with a disability no matter how much you want to live a normal life i say normal as in and it not be about advocating for disabled people or working in a job about disability you somehow fall into it by mistake i mean I, even when i'm doing stuff that's really nothing to do with my disability with whether it be uh so some of my travel work i'm an ambassador for a couple of uh big travel uh, uh, vehicle brands i still have to talk about my disability even when i'm just talking about how i want to travel you know and it's sometimes like even when i'm that's not my role and it's not my job i always get asked those questions and it's hard to step away from it you do feel that like you constantly have to advocate you constantly have to be talking about it um and maybe that's just because it's such a lack 
of of people in in you know out there that people are hungry for information i'm i'm not sure well i had a friend <clears throat> of mine who also who uses a a wheelchair and he, he's really 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 brilliant and he said to me one time deborah when you walk into a, a room you have to explain that disability is on the agenda because you do not have a physical disability he said mm. when i walk in the room when i come in the room because he doesn't walk when i come in the room everybody knows for sure the disability is going to be the, on the agenda some way. And I think that's why it is so important that we do have, you know, we representation matters that we have more people with physical disabilities in these conversations. As Antonio said, you know, it's very important that not everybody on the panel are all white males. You have to have diversity within males and then you have to have diversity, gender diversity and blah, blah, blah. So mm. I think we are making a mistake only because you know maybe people that are in the conversation do have invisible disabilities and they yeah. didn't come out i mean i remember neil was the first one i heard talking about coming out using the language of another community coming out as a person with dyslexia or ada and the adhd so obviously neil is broken well wait a minute is he or is he really brilliant so but I think there's a time now to not only to mix both of them together. I don't think we're doing a good job with it. I really don't so think we are. I found it really interesting, guys. Um, the recent Disability Pride Month um, and how. So what, what I learned about that month is firstly, so few disabled people that I know and myself included knew much about that. And and we didn't know so many people were sharing the flag. And people were going, wow, I didn't know we had a flag. Anyway, there was a lot of awareness raising, okay? And I, I, maybe that might be the not my fault, my, the people that I followed weren't aware, but that I felt very much like there was a learning going on. But secondly, there was really interesting conversations around being proud and what does that mean? And is it okay to not be proud? Is it okay to want to hide it? Is it a, there was a lot of questions. I found it a really fascinating um, month worth of content churning out on social media. Um, you know, personally, my response is, you know, absolutely be proud. That's, but I have no choice but to come out because I'm, by, by definition, as a wheelchair user, I've got no choice. It's, 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 it comes before me, you know. So in a way, I'd, it was the bravest thing and most important thing I ever had to do was to embrace it and say, but, you know, yeah, it was a really interesting thing. I'd love to know what you guys thought about that month. And do you think it should be, I don't know, more widely known? Or what was your response to it? Because I, yeah, I'm interested. Um, so again, it caught me a bit by surprise because yeah. um, I saw it popping up in my timeline. And um, because I've been working a lot in the diversity space, we have this sort of calendar. And there's so many overlapping days and months and, and everything else, especially when you go global. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit like Mother's Day. It happens multiple times a year um, yeah. <laughs> in different countries. So it, 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 sometimes there is this sort of, a, 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 I hate to say, it, element of fatigue in all of these days because sure. um, you can spend your whole life doing these days to celebrate. And, um, but I thought the conversation was useful. And, and like you, there were these conversations about uh whether it's okay to not yeah you know you can love yourself but not love your disability yeah um, or, or not love the effects of your disability and i think some of those conversations were really powerful uh, I, because, can i ask a clarifying question uh, excuse sure. me for being ignorant but i don't know what you're talking about i know sorry um i know that we had the ada the americans with disability act 30th year anniversary that's in july counts, but Deborah. that's all that counts i know isn't that terrible but i don't know what you're talking about what month are you talking about i didn't know there was a mm -hmm. flag so is this uk would it did i miss something it, which i no. think is you know right so I i'm not sure so as interesting, this is, talking that was my history. response that was okay. my response too i was Sorry. like what is this so basically there's there's a quite well-known american influencer you know, called carson i forget his name now so scrap that there's quite a well-known american influencer and he posted uh, he's very he's widely followed on on social media and he posted this image of a flag okay which well it's it posted an image it's a, it's like a, a series of colors in a stripe that goes in a zigzag and then kind of comes off and it was followed by a post explaining that july is disability pride month 
and that the flag had been adapted from the pride flag and there's a whole history behind it and then he talked about how you know the importance of disability pride month and how to spread the message and it was really like wow and i was like oh my gosh i've never heard of this and as, a, as an out and out disabled proud um person i was like oh my gosh i, I i'm so interested especially in a flag didn't know we had one so um i posted about it and um, a number of people were like, yeah, 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 get on board. Yeah, this has been going on. You know, they knew about it. Um, wow. But I, I have to, I admitted my ignorance. I was really like, I really didn't know about this and shared and shared and shared. And, and then following the hashtag throughout the month, disability, disabled and proud was fascinating, was fascinating, you know, to see all the different types of people cropping up all around the world, sharing their message or being inspired by others and saying, look, I didn't know about it either, but here I am. Wow. And, yeah, yeah. It was really cool. and we were we were so busy celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act 30. That's that right. I, well, that kind of came up at the end of it, didn't it? That was at the end mm. of the month. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Isn't so that in, terrible? In a way, it's and really we feel like we're leaders month. in this. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is what I, I felt a little bit. Maybe maybe I'm doing my, maybe I'm being a bit hard on myself, and maybe it isn't that well known. But the way that they the number of people that did know about it wrote about it, I was like, oh, oopsie, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know. But wow. it was it was really interesting. And so yeah, I really read up on it and as much as I could, and mm -hmm. I followed the hashtags like I have been following. And as I keep saying, you know, diversify your feed. How important it mm -hmm. is to do that. And I've been doing that a lot. And so yeah, it was it was very empowering to to follow other people. But just like we were talking about before, this idea that you know. Sometimes my disability, it sucks. It's really annoying and I don't like it. And that's, you know, doesn't mean that you, you can't have those feelings. Just, um, it's all on a spectrum, isn't it? Just how you respond to your own disability or your impairment and that's okay. And we can't know everything and it's okay. Yeah. I think we need to be nicer to each other when sometimes we're just seeking to understand, mm. you know, and we're all disability advocates. And I, I, I have seen disabled and proud. I did, I, but I. Yes, but 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 likewise, I I I wasn't aware that there was a month, and and I, I, and I don't want my comments about being sort of overcome, overwhelmed by all of these days and months to to seem negative. But I think there's also no, I think a it's true of, though. You know, you sometimes you have to conserve your energy because when you're advocating the whole time. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah, it, yeah. Take, it takes it takes a lot of it does take a lot of energy. Deborah, there's one of the flags, by the way. Um, there's multiple different versions because I remember everybody like started mocking up not their seen own it, flags. Yeah. Wow. Um, to so, your point, I'm going to educate about, myself about the energy thing. I, I really, mm -hmm. I really just I just have to chip in on that because I found I don't know about you guys, but with the lockdown and with the quarantining that energy reserve has had to be massively respected because it's such a, such a temptation lately to be devouring, you know, more and more information and news yeah. and also to be speaking out about the lived experience of disabled people who were already by and large, you know, experiencing some of the situation, some of these, these um, issues already, you know, being stuck at home or not being able to access work or whatever. I felt like there's a real need to work out exactly how to share yourself and you know really like ration ration that energy because it's it's been exhausting have you have you found that or how have you found it yeah yeah yes <laughs> I'm yes. Tired. yes i've had a i've had a week off sort of um and, and that's nice but but actually um i would have killed to have gone somewhere and and, and really unplugged it's been lovely yeah. sitting at home i'm privileged to have a, a lovely garden yeah. and, and all the rest of it but but it's not the same as as really sort of taking yourself out from somewhere yeah. Uh, yeah. and and doing something completely different and i do think that that people need that uh and, and and all the more reason for having accessible travel because you know what if you absolutely exhausted from having been doing all of this then you absolutely deserve to have accessible holidays too you know it's it's super important i've been pitching I, a lot i've yeah. been writing a lot actually about accessible hotels accessible beaches accessible spaces like trying to get travel magazines to plug those and i've done quite well actually because it's really like you know we deserve holidays too we need a break too so uh -huh. it's really important to spread that message isn't it a, a, a country that does quite well in that space is Spain. So uh, over the past 20 years, they have been, they have been organizing conferences 
just mm -hmm. dedicated to accessible tourism. They have, you know, of course, this year they're not taking place, but they usually uh, between May and, and October, they organize quite a good number of, uh, of uh, conferences and events focused on accessible tourism, uh, where uh, hotels and hospitality and other sectors, they would uh, debate how to improve accessibility yeah. in, in the different business sectors. It's the only place that I've been which has a double wheelchair lift in the um, in the transportation. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah, it's all right. We can accommodate more than one chair. It's like, whoop, whoa. up it comes. So no, so I, I I went I went last October. Seems like a lifetime ago um, to the Onse Accessible Tourism event, and it it was, you know, they really are very accessible you know, the the infrastructure is accessible the, uh, the the cities are generally um you know there's step free access in a lot of places a lot more that you know than in many european cities because don't forget they're old too so yeah. what it is is proof that you can adapt uh, and that we shouldn't be just saying oh well it's old it's there we can't do anything to it because you can adapt right. you can do it simply and we see though that's one one example. I've had people come over from Europe to the United States, and, and even though we've made a lot of progress, mm -hmm. they've been shocked at how inaccessible our public transportation is, for example. So yeah. it, it's I, I love what Spain's doing, but Sophie, you need to get out there and you need to be talking about this travel because it, it, it is such an issue all over the world. It's such, a, and as we all know, when you something accessible it makes it more accessible for all of us no, I, I, and if, if you follow a, a few accounts on, on instagram you see people from different parts of the world talking about that topic from from, from brazil to south africa f to germany it's a it's a very uh, interesting topic and i know and go, go, going back to the, the pride month uh, that generated some conflict situation within the people with the disability community some People were in favor, others were really much engaged. But um, some people on, on the social media channels, on Twitter, on Instagram, they do that every year. It's part of who they are. And, and they show that identity you know, uh, 365 days a year. And I think that's more important than Pride Month, you know. I think you're right, you know, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. It doesn't just stop after a month. We've got to keep going. And I mean, I just want to finish, actually. I know we, we are going to finish soon, but the, you know, the Paralympics, guys, the things that, that was going to happen in, uh, in um, Tokyo and, the, you know, I do, I do a lot of work with Toyota and the efforts that they have gone to to innovate and to change. I'm sure you guys know all about this, but it would have been such an amazing example of how you know, how we can innovate and how we can change and how we can make things more inclusive. So I'm looking forward to seeing hopefully the games happen next year and seeing that change and the conversation keep going and the standards get higher. And like you say, it's the most important thing. We need to say people out and about, visible, working out. It may, all of this, all of it affects everything, doesn't it, you know? So yeah, I think that's an area that I, I will always be working on um, to make sure that we get improvements. But yeah, how we go. So um, as we close and we need to thank Barclays Access, My Clear Text, and Mike Link for keeping us on air and captioned and, and rolling. Um, why don't you just remind us how we can find you on social media, etc.? So I'm mostly on Twitter and Instagram. I do occasionally go on Facebook, but I'm on Instagram under Soph L. Morg and under Soph Morg TV on Twitter. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you, Sophie. We look Thanks, forward guys. to our chat on Tuesday. Brilliant. Thank you for having me.